Um, let's pray and let's get into what we came here for tonight. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for you, what you do in our life, for the fact that you give us laughter, and you give us love. We're grateful for your word. We're grateful for the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, Lord, and we're grateful for the many ways that you bless us. Lord, um, we feel a great need to be consistent and to be brought back to a focus of your word and the importance of your kingdom, which is why we're here tonight, Lord. So I pray that you would just give us hearts and give us a vision as we dive into your word, as we look into this series, uh, going through the Sermon on the Mount. I just pray for your blessing to be on our hearts and our minds as we receive your words and as truly as we just would hear what you would have to tell each and every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so... If you were here last week, you know we jumped into a series, The Sermon on the Mount, A Kingdom Upside Down. And for those, we talked a little bit about the intro here. We looked, started jumping into it. We discussed the Beatitudes. But we remember, right, the Sermon on the Mount is an in-your-face message that Jesus shared on how Christ followers are to live their life. And then and now, we know that when people read the Sermon on the Mount, sometimes they don't understand it. And sometimes we really find a hard way to apply it to our lives. But we're going to learn and we're going to grow and see what God has for us. So I'm going to remind you again this week. We talked about it. When we look at the Sermon on the Mount and we kind of get all edgy, we have to remember if we find ourselves arguing with the sermon at any point, it might mean either that there is something wrong with us or we interpreted the sermon wrongly. All right? Because then we'll go to the words of James, and I like what James has to say in James 1.19. Be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And truly, when we get into God's word, and especially in an in-your-face message, we want to make sure we're hearing rightly, and we're understanding what's being said, so that we can live rightly, correct? All right, so tonight I've titled the message, the great paradox. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 5 still. We're going through this, so if you want to make your way over there. We're going to see. Last week, we looked at the opening statement, and Jesus spoke the words on the hillside there in northeast Galilee area. We started into the Beatitudes. We looked at them, and remember, we decided not to take this simple approach, right? We didn't go simply with the fact of Beatitude or blessed equals happy. We understand that blessed is equals the approval of God, and we want the approval of God. So remember, as we look at the Beatitudes, the question that we ask ourselves is not, do we want to be happy? Because of course, we all want to be happy, right? But the question is that we should be asking is, do we want God's approval more than anything else? Because that is what matters. That is what his kingdom is made up of, of people that he approves us of. of. And we see here that Jesus is really preaching to that. So, paradox. Does anybody know what a paradox is? And it's not a pair of ducks, okay? A paradox is a statement seemingly contradictory or um, a, a opposed to common sense, but yet perhaps is true. So I'll give you an example. Ready? Here's a good example of a paradox. Less is more. Makes sense, right? Contradicts, but makes sense. Or how about this one? Do the thing you think you cannot do. Anybody tried that one recently? All right. I'm going to say a word. No one get mad at me. You're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. Another paradox. See, a paradox is a statement that appears at first to be contradictory, but upon reflection, then it makes sense. It's a device that is used to have readers discover stuff and to really draw into what is being said there. The Beatitudes, in a sense, could sound like a paradox. They don't quite sound right, but as you listen to it, as you read it, as you dwell on it, you come to find out that it really does make sense. So, the first Beatitude that we looked at last week was, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven, so let's actually, you know what, let's read the Beatitudes again, and then we'll get into our Beatitudes for today. So in Matthew chapter 5, we'll pick up in verse 3, and we'll read through verse 10. It says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, 
for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And the last one here, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So we looked at verse 3 last week. We're going to pick up, we're going to look at verse 4 this week with the first one. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And we see here is those who mourn. And remember what we said. We could take the simpleness of things, right? And we could take the statement here and we can read it and it could be kind of ironic if we read it in the way of blessed meaning happy because we would simply read this as happy are the unhappy. Does that make any sense? Have you ever seen an unhappy person be happy? I haven't seen it. I haven't. No, we're not going to go there. But remember, the Beatitudes aren't commands. They're not direct um, commands for us. Jesus isn't saying that you are spiritually superior to be a mourn in mourning or a mourning but this world, many people are already mourning, right? They're sad over their state. They're sad over the things that have come upon them. They don't like the way that things are going, the loss of loved ones, the way that the world is. There's many people that are mourning. And Jesus says here, those that mourn will be comforted, presuming that truly they'll be comforted by the kingdom of God. So we're going to set a pattern. We're going to look at what not and is, right? Because we want to make sure we're going in the right direction. We want to be tracking. So the first thing we're going to see here with um, those who mourn is we're going to look at and um, put it out there is what those who mourn is not. Right? Because right? we want to know what it's not. It's kind of fun to learn what something isn't before we learn what it is. So what those who mourn is not is first blessed are the grim, cheerless Christians. Now, some people interpret it this way. Have you ever met a Christian that's always down and not happy? They're never cheerful. They grimace at everything. Those guys are crazy and they don't like me. Um, I think it's crazy, but there are church people like that. I like how one pastor put in his um, journal, and to quote him, he said this, I've been to church today and I'm not depressed. Why would you go to church to be depressed? It doesn't make any sense, but that's not what it means. The second one there is, blessed are those, it does not, is not, blessed are those who are mourning over difficulties of life. The Bible doesn't say that we're to mourn over the things of life constantly, being sad and being downtrodden and looking at life in defeat. And it's not saying that mourning by itself is a state that we want to be in. But it's also not saying that sorrow is not blessed any more than laughter is blessed. Neither one puts us in a better state. So we see what it's not. Let's see what it is. Those who mourn is the awareness of how lowly and needy we are because of sin. The second stage of spiritual blessings is one thing to be spiritually poor, as we learned last week, and acknowledge it, but now it's another thing to grieve and mourn over it. Or, who likes theological words? For all you big people that like theological words, confession is one thing, repentance is another. And that's where mourning brings us. Jesus is telling us that it's important to lament, to mourn over our sins. If we have sinned, he's saying it's okay to be upset about it and it's equally valid for us to mourn over our sins because where do our sins put us away from God they're not helping us draw closer to God they're taking us away from him and we enter into that place when we mourn over our sins we come to a place where we are promised comfort by the Holy Spirit and the cool thing is is as we mourn over our sins we are actually halfway through the gospel of what Jesus has for us as far as the gospel the good news because the only way to get to the good news is to understand what we don't have and why we don't have it because of our sins. And truly, that's what Paul was getting to when he writes to the church in Corinth about grief. You see, Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, and he said some things in 1 Corinthians that really upset the church, and he didn't write them a nice letter back saying, oh, I'm so sorry I hurt your feelings. 
You know what he said to him? Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, he said this. He said, I now rejoice, not because you grieved, but because your grief led to repentance. He went on to make the statement even further when he said, for you were grieved as God willed, so that you didn't experience any loss from us. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but sorrow of the world produces death. The godly grief over our sins produces an, earnest, an earnestness in which makes the church a zeal, which makes the people want to do right for God, to be approved by God. This grief is a form of mourning that leads to repentance of one's sins. Because without that repentance, we can't go forward in the gospel. We can't go forward in salvation. And we definitely can't, as Paul says in verse 13 of that chapter, be comforted. Because we're not at a place to receive it. The passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 is completely in line with the second beatitude here. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. When we confess our sins to God, the Holy Spirit comforts us with the knowledge of forgiveness, which is why John wrote this in 1 John 9, uh, 1, 9, when he said, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we can see here with mourning. It's not about being unhappy. It's about lamenting, mourning over our sins so that we can be comforted by God for what he has for us. So you guys know, as we look at something, we always have to ask the question, right? So what? So what do I walk away with from here? So the so what, the question to ask is, are we mourning over sin? It's very important to see that I know and understand mourning is not the fad of the time. Actually, I can't recall, and I kind of tried to look it up to see if it was ever a fad. It wasn't. Um, to be honest with you, typically when a person is mourning, people feel sorry for them and think they're insane, right? Like, they're like, just get over it. What are you mourning over? You have no excuse. Just, it's happened, it's done, move on. But despite this, it's necessity for spiritual, a healthy spiritual life to mourn. Mourning and spiritual life and the health, mourning is not optional. Spiritual mourning is necessary for our salvation. One cannot be a true Christian if one has not mourned over their sin. We cannot be forgiven if we are not sorry for our sins. The cool thing is it's a great day when we see our sinful state for what it is apart from God's grace. And we begin to mourn over it, the devastating dimensions of our life. We see that in our soul, our words, and our deeds are in decline because of that separation. Or as Paul put it in Romans chapter three, regarding our soul when we don't mourn, he said, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. All alike have become worthless. There is no one who does what is good, not even one. That is the state we are in when we don't mourn over our sins, how our soul feels and that translates from our soul to our words he continues in Romans chapter 3 verses 13 and 14 it says their throats is an open grave they deceive with their tongues vipers venom is under their lips their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness we don't mourn over our sins our soul aches our words that we speak are full of bitterness and cursing and not only does it translate from there, from our soul to our words, but to our actions and our deeds. And Paul continues in Romans 3, verses 15 through 17, where he says, their feet are swift to shed blood, ruin and recklessness are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. This is the place that we're at when we don't mourn our sins. This is how far we are from God when we refuse his grace. But the great day, the most glorious day, is when we are truly comforted with our or confronted with our individual sins. We call sin, sin. We mourn over what has taken place, the gap, the space that we have. 
And it is then that we are comforted immediately by our Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit. The actual sense of Christ's words here is, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be immediately comforted, and we shall continue to be comforted. It's not a one-time thing. It's a continual thing. Because when we come to that state where we're mourning over our sins, not just our sins, but the world's sins, we understand that it's nothing we can do, but what he does for us. The basis of his comfort is what we all need and strive for, and that is forgiveness. And believers are truly the only ones who understand this form, um, send in the freedom from this form of guilt from our sins and our lives. Because we know it's nothing we can do, but it's something he has done for us, comforting us and giving us that peace and that forgiveness that we need in our lives. Therefore, the comfort springs up from within, revealing a changed life. We've looked now at blessed are those who mourn, blessed are those who pour in spirit. We're gonna go for the next one, it's the meek. Or as it says there in verse five, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. I'm gonna keep with tradition, all right? So we're gonna put out there as far as what meek is not. What meek is not, I got a list for you because this one's kind of a fun one, all right? So here we go. What meek is not, first, meek is not weakness. It does not indicate cowardliness, spineless, timidness, or a willingness to have peace at any cost, all right? So it, meek is not weakness. It is also, it does not suggest an indecisiveness, wishy-washiness, or lack of confidence, all right? The next one it says there is it does not suggest shyness or withdrawn personality. This is not the introverted person, okay? Of course, they probably think I'm weird anyways, but it's all right. And the last one there is it does not reduce down to niceness. Meek does not reduce down to niceness. So we see what it's not. Let's see what it is. So what is meek? What is meek? Well, the Greek word meek developed in classical literature and how it is used in the New Testament translate meek equals gentle. Meekness or gentleness implies self-control. The person who is meek is able to balance one's anger. Meekness is strength under control. A meek person can be strong, but a meek person is able to balance their strength and their anger with their humility against their pride. Those, and meekness truly, this is a fun one, because how many of you guys are good at your emotions and controlling them? Nobody, sweet, we're all in the same boat. Um, I'm either really happy or I'm really grumpy. You can ask my kids sometimes. They look at me, oh, dad's not in a good mood. You're right, I'm not in a good mood, but I need to get out of it, right? I have a problem with the balance. But that balance comes with time, as we're gonna see. Those that are meek before God submit to his will and comfort and conform to his word. On that same note, meekness, we have to fall under God. Meekness before man, though we might be strong, we are humble, gentle, patient, and long-suffering. And I was trying to think of an example of this, and I definitely knew there wasn't one in my life, so that was out. And then I thought I'd go to the internet. That wasn't helpful. So I went to the Bible, and I found the best example I could, probably the greatest example of meekness. And when I tell you who it is, you're all going to say, of course, Roy. That is the best example of meekness. And you violated rule number one of Jesus being the answer. And I did, okay? The example I give is Jesus. Because Jesus is by far the best example that I could find of meekness. And the situation that I'm gonna talk about this in is in when Jesus stood before Pilate. Because he not only stood before Pilate, but he stood before God in that same moment. And we don't always realize it. You see, Jesus stood before Pilate who was a proudful, ruler of men. And in that very moment that Jesus stood before Pilate on that trial that was uncalled for, not right, and definitely not needed, Jesus stood there, embodied in meekness. 
He became the prisoner, though he was the free man. Jesus was in control. Because at any point in time, if I would have been Jesus, I would have been calling down angels. There would have been something going on, right? But not Jesus. Jesus stood there. And he took on what he needed to. He controlled his anger. He controlled his feelings. And he held them in place. But as he stood there before Pilate, he also stood before God. Because Jesus looked to face the cross. And Jesus could find comfort in knowing that he was doing what the Father asked him to do. Even though we know a couple chapters before, where was he? He was in the garden, he was praying, he was asking for the cup to be passed from him and if there's any other way. But he knew what he had to do. He had to submit to the Father's will. He stood before man and he stood before God. And we can see how Jesus' words, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Because as Jesus would go to the cross, not only would he face that, but he would inherit the earth, the universe. The promise, they shall inherit the earth, proves that God will not allow his meek ones to end up on the short end of the deal. And the thing is here with the meek ones, he's not talking about this earth. What he's talking about when he says we should all inherit the earth, he's talking about his kingdom. He's talking about the new heaven, the new earth that will be coming. That is what we will inherit. So as we see here in this one, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. We come again to, so what? So the question we have for this is, are we in control of our meekness? Jesus' words, blessed are the meek, are clear that the gentle and meek spirit has divine approval by God. Now I know no one is perfect. And if you are, come talk to me because I want to find out how you get there. Especially in the idea of meekness um, and demonstrating meekness in our lives. Not one of us is strong enough to have the only response be that of love. I don't know about you, when someone cuts you off on the roadway, is your first response, I love you, man, or is it another couple choice words? Um, or hand signals, whatever you want to do, I don't care. Um, when you come home and the house is a wreck and the kids are bouncing off the wall, is the nicest words coming out of your mouth in love? No, probably not. We don't do it. No one totally escapes self and pride. But we can take some steps to get there, all right? And that is the cool thing. So I want to encourage you in this idea of controlling our meekness, and I want to give you some path, a path to Christ-like meekness, all right? So path to Christ-like meekness starts with we must realize that a gentle spirit is a gift from the Holy Spirit. And I say that over in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 23. It tells us, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Here it is, gentleness and self-control. The Holy Spirit gives us the gifts that we need for it, right? So that's the first thing. The second thing on this path, we realize that the gentle spirit is a gift from the Holy Spirit. The second thing is we must realize our example to learn is from Jesus. That's why I gave you the example of Jesus, all right? But with that, Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 says, take up my yoke and learn from me. Bless I am lowly and humble in heart and you will find rest for your soul. When we learn from Jesus, we learn how to be humble. We learn how to be lowly. We learn how to stand our right place before man and our right place before God. So we see that we must realize that a a gentle spirit is a gift from the Holy Spirit. We must realize our example to learn from is Jesus. And the third thing in our path to Christ-like meekness is we must realize it is a process. You see, we start with the first beatitude of poor in spirit. Then we progress to a spirit of mourning and then meekness, which grows out of the first two beatitudes. It's a process. And it's not an overnight process. I really wish it was. Unfortunately, it's a process. It's a process of us attempting, learning, and going forward. And as we strive for these things, 
we're able to sit there and withstand when the test comes. The test is to whether we are truly meek or if we're not truly meek, is whether we can say, it's not whether we can say we are poor sinners, but rather, what do we do when someone else calls us a sinner? That's the question. That's the test. That's where our response puts us in our right place. So we've looked at blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are those who are meek. Tonight we're going to end out with blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled, or the righteousness of hunger. Question for you. How many of you have heard the phrase, you are what you eat? How many were told by your parents as you were snacking on junk food, you are what you eat? Okay. The phrase well applies here that we crave, what we crave for or what we desire for will turn into what fills us. Christ declares that hunger for righteousness is essential for spiritual health and sanctification. And it's, the, uh, it's going to be critical here, and I want to be careful how I look at this one because as I was studying this one, it, it was eye-opening for me because I really see how people could take this one and go the wrong way quickly. And there's actually some gospels formed off of this because they've taken the, as we have talked about, the simple or the easy approach and just gone with what's simple. So we're still going to look at the difference between what righteousness is not and is, but I want to look at the definitions of righteousness, okay? So the term righteousness has three different applications found in Scripture, all right? So righteousness, first, we find it um, would be called objective righteousness or our justification. We find this righteousness in Romans where God reckons on behalf of the believers. Um, this is something called righteousness from God, uh, Paul writes in Romans 3, chapter 3, verse 21 and 22, and also in Romans 1, 17, when he says, For it is in the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, just as it is written, the, righteousness will, the righteous will live by faith. While the gift of righteousness is foundation for every believer's salvation, that is the definition that we look at first with objective righteousness. It's what is important for our salvation, coming to God. That's not what it means when applied to this beatitude, okay? The second one there, social righteousness, the righteousness um, treatment of the poor and the oppressed. This focus on life lived and how we live life in relation to the poor and the oppressed. Does this sound familiar to anybody? Social justice gospel. This is where they get it from and why they go there so fast because it's not about anything else you do but how you help others who are oppressed or less fortunate to you to be better. Again, this is not what this is saying. So what is it, what is it saying? Well, that brings us to our third one. And this is the root meaning here is determined by seven occurrences of righteousness as inner righteousness in the Sermon on the Mount indicates it is, means a subjective righteousness. And it is an inner righteousness that works itself out in one's, works itself out in one's living in conformity to God's will, or simply put, righteous living. That is the righteousness that is talking about here in this beatitude. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness long to live righteously for the righteousness to prevail in the world, for God's will to be done. The one who hungers and thirsts wants this character of the kingdom of God as they go forward. And while the language of this beatitude doesn't make a lot of sense to the modern ear, because to be honest with you, as you read it and you think about like, well, if I'm hungry or I'm thirsty, that's easy. If I'm thirsty and I'm at home, I just go over to the sink or the refrigerator and I got cold water, right? Instantly. If I'm hungry, I just go to the refrigerator, or if I happen to be out driving about, I just stop at any corner at a fast food, and I can have food in under a minute, right? It's not a common thing for us to think about starvation or dehydration, but the intensity of the text does make it difficult to feel this because of how we look at things and the culture that we're in. 
But for those that Jesus spoke to on the hillside that day, to those in Galilee, to those in Judea, when he shared about this, this was a very evident thing for them. Because for them, any moment could turn into a moment of dehydration of not having water or starvation for not having any food. But there's a thing here that God is trying to have us understand is this beatitude further intensified by the fact that our hungering and thirst is continual. We are constantly hungry. We are constantly thirsty. I know we get full, right? We all sit down at a big meal and we'll get full, but what happens at some point in time? We get hungry again. And if you have Chinese food, you're getting hungry faster, right? We all get hungry, but it's a continual thing. And as I was looking through and I was thinking like, Man, hunger is a continual thing. Thirst is a continual thing. Our desire for righteousness should be continual for what God would have in living a righteous life. And I was thinking about King David. I really like King David. As I read through his life and I study it, his, from his leadership to the things that he went through, you could really understand and relate to him. But the crazy thing is, is David had a life unlike most. David was called with a man after God's own heart. He was a real person that we could see and we could relate to. And David, he even talked about this continual thirst and this continual hunger. He wrote a bunch of the Psalms. And the cool thing is he wrote in the Psalms, he lamented, he complained, he begged, he pleaded. But he also talked about his hunger and his thirst. And he said this in Psalm 63. He said, oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. We too should have that same desire, that same thirst, that same hunger for the righteousness that God would have for us. God, Jesus promised to fill the hungry, to fill them with as much as they could eat. If we come before him, he's going to fill us. He's going to give to us. Or as one um, pastor put it, he's going to fill us to be, um, the promise to fill the hungry, to fill them as much as they could eat. He says, this is a strange feeling that both satisfies and keeps us longing for more. Unlike sin, sin tastes good, but it never satisfies. So as we see Blessed are the righteous, or those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. We could truly see that we're working and striving and being hungering for what God wants, conforming to his will, living righteously in our lives. So what, you ask? I'm glad you guys asked. You guys are so talkative. Question for you. Are we hungry for the right things? Consider this fourth beatitude as we open. Blessed are those who are hungry for the righteousness, for they shall be filled. I'm going to add in right there. Like the starving do for food and the thirsty do for water. For righteousness will add righteous living. For they shall be fully satisfied. If I ask the question again and we thought about the phrase, you are what you eat, is not as simple as it first appears. The tragedy of our time is that the world is hungering and thirsting, but it's thirsting for all the wrong things and hungering for all the wrong things. The world thirsts and hungers for sex, wealth, violence, and excitement. The sad thing is the church, who should be opposite of this, unfortunately has fallen and hungered for the same things. And the people of the church and their diets are making them empty and pathetic as the world. We must remember that Jesus has provided us the menu and the appetite. The main course is righteousness, conformity to his will. We are supposed to be hungry for righteousness and pursue it with all that is within us. The result is profound sanctification now and forever. So I ask you this, how is your appetite? And with that, I want to answer it with some steps so we could grow our appetite from the Beatitudes that we have seen so far. We must begin with the first Beatitude, true poverty of spirit and realizing that there is nothing within us that commends us to God. We must affirm our spiritual bankruptcy. Next, we must graduate to the second Beatitude, 
truly mourning our sins as well as the sins around us. Then we ascend to the third beatitude by allowing our spiritual bankruptcy and mourning to instill in us true meekness and a gentle spirit. And finally, we live the logic of the Beatitudes. We'll be able to desperately hunger and thirst for righteousness. True hunger and thirst gnaws at a person. It is an all-consuming passion and desire for God's righteousness. Not a righteousness to save, but a righteousness in doing God's will. And in turn, we will look for the, seek the approval of of God in our hearts, which really makes us change the, que- the idea of this question, we are what we eat. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you again that we could draw into your word, we could see what you have for us, that desire to grow. And as we study these beatitudes, Lord, and we look for the, pe- see the people that you want for your kingdom, I pray that you continue the work in each and every one of us. We understand these aren't commands for us to live, but these are the characteristics of the people you are looking for. And we pray that we can live these characteristics out among the people that we come in contact with and we live and do life with. Lord, we love you and we thank you. And all God's people said, amen.